We are off to the races as Atari Archive looks at Steeplechase. Our next two VCS games are rather novel in that they are both first-party Atari games that are also retailer exclusives. Today's game, Steeplechase, and Stellar Track are the first two of four games that had some kind of exclusivity to Sears, then one of the largest retailers in the United States and a partner of Atari's in the home gaming space, since it stocked Atari's dedicated Pong console in 1975 under its own branding. This Sears deal is rather fascinating, even though we don't have all the details on how it came about. According to Ron Stringari, who was Atari's vice president of marketing at the time, and who worked at Sears as a buyer before that, Sears was always in the market for exclusive products, which in gaming went back as far as their initial interest in selling Atari's Pong as a full Sears exclusive. With the VCS rapidly becoming a huge hit in 1980, Sears opened discussions with Atari over getting some exclusive software, stuff Stringari believes was either already planned or was being thought up, with only some minor alterations being necessary, though Stringari did not remember why these specific games were chosen. One of these games, Super Breakout, was only a timed exclusive for Sears, which got to sell it from October 1981 through the Christmas season before Atari started distributing it under its own name at other stores. But the other three were true Sears exclusives and are all a little unusual in some form or another. In the case of Steeplechase, it's a conversion of an Atari arcade game by the same name about horse racing that came out nearly five and a half years earlier in October 1975. Predating microprocessors being widely used in arcade video games in the first place, the original is a one to six player game where each person competes to finish the race before everyone else pushing their lone buttons to leap over hurdles. It wasn't a big hit for Atari, which reportedly only sold around 500 cabinets, but the game made an impression on Atari Consumer Division developer Jim Huether. Given the limitations of the VCS, Huether reduced the total number of players down to four and made it a paddle controller game. While the button on the controller is still used to jump, the paddles are used to set how high each jump will be, which proves to make the game much more skill-based and enjoyable than its predecessor. The game types allow players to decide how good the computer-controlled jockeys will be, between three difficulty levels, and whether or not the hurdles to jump will appear at uniform distances or at random ones. The difficulty switches do nothing in this particular game. According to a 2007 interview with Huether by Scott Stilfen, while he was limited in the number of animation frames he had to work with for the horses, Quaither said what he did have proved pretty convincing, as players showed empathy for horses when they stumbled. It also proved to be as popular among girls as it was among boys, he said, though it's unclear if he was referring to market testing or feedback after the game had reached store shelves. In all, Quaither estimates that Steeplechase took about four or five months to complete. As a single-player experience, Steeplechase is a pretty decent one. Assessing the right height to jump is fairly easy, but ensuring you time your jump appropriately given the approach speed and the height you're targeting takes some practice to get a handle on. The computer opponents are also no slouch. While on the lowest difficulty they're pretty easy to beat, on the good difficulty they will only mess up a little bit, and on the hardest they run practically perfect races, requiring you to really only surpass them by jumping at the minimum needed height for each hurdle. Functionally speaking, the variations on whether or not hurdles spawn at set or random distances doesn't seem to be as huge a factor as one would think. In either case, the game tends to give you as much time to react and reset your jump height as the other. The one exception to this comes closer to the end of races, and a nice little consideration to players further behind, as the horses move to the right side of the screen they will get less time to react to incoming hurdles, and thus can be more likely to be tripped up. With hurdles that appear at regular intervals, you can, at the least, make high jumps to stay on your feet, but when they're appearing randomly, you have less time to prepare yourself and make your jumps. Quaither considered Steeplechase to be a lot of fun as a multiplayer game. The COVID-19 pandemic has essentially prevented me from trying this game's full four-player mode out as of this recording, but by putting the computer on its weakest setting, you can essentially render it a non-issue in races with less than a full quartet of players. It does at the least seem like it would lend itself well to an expansive playing field. As one final bonus, players can opt to not enter a race at all, letting the computer to run against itself. I guess it's a nice substitute if you want to bet on horse races without actually going to the track. 
On the general package front, Steeplechase is the second game to follow the new Atari manual style championed by Steve Wright and introduced with Pele's Championship Soccer, giving each of the horses a goofy drawing, personality, and background that has zero bearing on their performance in-game. It's a cute little thing that, as noted in the soccer video, hadn't really been done on a home console before this point, and helps add a lot of flavor to games that really had few other opportunities to do so. It's a little surprising to see even the Sears releases would follow this trend, but other than the branding and cover art, Sears VCS games tend to be identical to their Atari counterparts. Steeplechase is something of a singular experience on a home console. While there are other horse racing games, they all had more of a gambling bent than just being pure racing. This all said, the Intellivision game Horse Racing features both gambling and player-controlled racing. In Mattel's title, players first place bets on the outcome of the race before taking control of up to two of the four horses running at any given time. Each horse in the race will have its own characteristics that will only become clear after multiple runs, with the game being over after ten such races have taken place. Player-controlled jockeys can either coax horses or whip them to get more speed, though since the horses have finite amounts of stamina, if they get tired out too soon, they'll drop their speed down to a trot to finish. In practice, it's actually pretty difficult to keep player-controlled horses in the lead early on, as there is more finesse to managing their energy stores than the game lets on at first. Both horse racing and steeplechase would be reviewed in the March 1982 edition of Electronic Games. Bill Kunkel and Arnie Katz praised horse racing as the best gambling game on any home console, while they called Steeplechase a modest but pleasant addition to the VCS library that offers a nice change of pace from the usual fare on the platform. They add that the height controls for jumps makes for an interesting skill separation. While players can clear any hurdle with a high jump, the loss of speed from being airborne means better players could get ahead with lower jumps, or crash and burn from hitting the hurdles entirely. I'd also like to mention the Bally Professional Arcade hosted several horse racing basic games that appear to be based off of the horse race program in David All's 101 basic computer games. In these, you simply place your bets and the computer runs the race for you. These are simple and are essentially rudimentary versions of what the Intellivision horse racing game ended up as, but they are an interesting and somewhat accessible look at some early gaming programs. That said, there are some more elaborate attempts at these betting games for Bally Basic. The most notable among these are most likely Mike Peace's Horse Race 1 and 2, which give players a visual element of watching the horses run. There is also the truly strange Horse Race Math, which tasks players with solving math problems to move their horse forward, a concept that Atari itself would attempt in 1982's Math Grand Prix. This would prove to be Huether's final VCS game. While he provided some technical assistance with Bob Polero's Real Sports Volleyball, Quather would spend the months after completing Steeplechase working on a few VCS projects that didn't go anywhere, a football game and a submarine game, and a couple of Atari computer animation programs called Microflick and Micromovie that also went unreleased. He would eventually use the tools in those programs on his Atari 5200 titles, including Real Sports Football and the unreleased Zevius. Quather himself noted an interesting pattern to his titles. Everything he wrote, from flag capture right up to Real Sports and Football, was designed to be played with more than one person. And sure enough, while several of these, including Steeplechase, can be played alone, it's really the multiplayer that drives these titles and makes them worth revisiting. But before working on the 5200, Huether tried writing a couple prototype display drivers for Atari's unreleased follow-up to the VCS, known alternately as Super Stella, Sylvia, the CX-1000, or the 3200. This is the first time we've touched on this platform, though probably not the last. Technically speaking, the Super Stella prototype featured a full 6502 microprocessor, instead of the cut-down 6507 used in the VCS. It also featured an improved version of the TIA chip found on the VCS called the STIA, a revised Antic chip from the 8-bit computer line called Frantic, a Votrax voice synthesis chip, and two kilobytes of memory, a massive upgrade from the VCS's 128 bytes. Also notable is that Super Stella would have included a read-write line on the cartridge port that would make it easier to access on-cart memory or custom ICs, and it used analog joysticks. Quather said in his interview that he found Super Stella to not be powerful enough to be considered a next-gen upgrade in hardware, particularly at a time when the Intellivision was on the market with its own clear advantages over the VCS. 
More damning for the project was a re reproducible fatal error that another developer, Bob Smith, discovered that would cause the system to completely crash. Smith said the error seemed to be in the chip designs for the system itself, and no one seemed able or willing to track it down and figure out how to fix it, ultimately leading the machine to be cancelled. For better or worse, Atari would ultimately opt to shelve the Super Stella in favor of a revised version of the Atari 400, which became the 5200. Still, for Waythers, Steeplechase is a pretty interesting note to end his VCS run on. Waythers previous games are also rather unusual choices. Putting Steeplechase in the same company as the love it or hate it flag capture, as well as Skydiver, itself a conversion of a minor Atari arcade game. None of these really fit neatly into the realm of common and obvious game themes, such as sports, shooters, or major arcade hits, all of which have dominated Atari's releases on the platform thus far. None of them are bad games, but they all fall into the category of gap fillers, those titles that flesh out a console library without being in the top tier of releases. Steeplechase isn't probably the first choice for a multiplayer VCS game like Warlords or Combat, but it's a perfectly decent game. Next time, we boldly go where no one has gone before. On the VCS, anyway.